us off our land. We were no longer able to offer the sacrifices. And we were scattered amongst other people that we didn't know. How do you survive that, which in itself is a miracle? We survived it because we are a creative people. And we said, let's take the idea of temple, priesthood, lamb, and make it into something that will work in exile. So temple becomes synagogue or house of worship, and there are many of them. Priests become, not necessarily rabbis, probably all the people, because God said, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And also for the land, we always had the hope that one day we would return to the land of Israel. And thankfully, in our day and age, in 1948, the state of Israel, after about 2,000 years, where Jews had lived there, but we did not own it or control it, but Jews had always lived there. It was finally declared a Jewish state by the United Nations and recognized. So um, that's how we uh, creatively were talking about the terrors and the horrors that happened at the Boston Marathon. It seemed like uh, a lot of our people's history was replete with, with every te terror, every horror that you could think of from the tortures and the hellfires of the Inquisition to expulsion culminating in the Holocaust and six million dead, as I said, one and a half million of them children. How do you possibly survive that? We've been called prisoners of hope. You wonder why maybe there are so many Jewish psychologists. Well, maybe you've got to be able to figure out things so you can go on. You wonder why, at least in the past, there were so many Jewish comedians and entertainers. Maybe you have to learn to laugh through your tears, because if you can't laugh, the tears are going to overcome you. So we found out through a creativity and psychology and other means how to survive and how to live. I don't know if that answered your question, uh, but now what we did was, again, we made a re replica of the temple, in a sense, that was in Jerusalem. But so we say, it isn't that temple, okay? This is a replica. We don't have everything they had in there. But we do have three things that make it a sanctuary. You can take a home and make it into a sanctuary. You can take this space and make it into a sanctuary. You just need three things. You don't need a building like this and call it a temple, whatever. You need an Ark of the Covenant, which you saw, which houses the Torahs, or the five books of Moses. Above the ark, you'll notice a light. It's called the eternal light, and even though we understand it's symbolic, there was a light bulb that, unfortunately, today had gone out, all right? Uh, we'll, just, we'll just replace it, but I, you know, in our minds, it's, it's still going. It talks about the eternality of our people, of our God, of our faith, of our hope, and so on. And also, you always have to, even if it's a small step, Whenever you come up to read from God's Word, or to preach, or whatever you're doing, you have to go up steps. So we always go up in holiness, we never go down in holiness. There was an argument actually in the Talmud for Hanukkah, where we celebrate the victory of the Maccabees and the miracle of the oil for eight days, where it was supposed to last for one day, and there was enough to last for eight days because of a miracle. One of the rabbis said, we should light eight candles the first day, and then each subsequent day decrease them by a candle. The other rabbi said, no, we should light one candle each day until the menorah is filled with light. The second rabbi is the one who won. Based on the principle I just told you, we always increase in holiness. We do not decrease in holiness. And that's a good way to live. So that's a long answer to a short question. Anyway, anybody else? Yes. Um, what else is contained in the Ark of the Torah? That's it. That's it. God. God's presence. For those multiple. Torahs? See again, because because we, we can't have an image of God, and and we can't have a, a symbol of God necessarily as as you do, like a cross. Okay. Um, all we have is God and. and, and when I say all we have, that's quite a bit, I think, okay, is God's word. 
And that's at, and God's word, because we can't see God. We believe God was never incarnate, that God is invisible and indivisible. Three doesn't equal one. One equals one. One God, indivisible. Okay? I know that we're probably talking about the nation being indivisible, but I'm talking about God being indivisible. So the only thing we can see of God or know of God is God's word, which is holy, that teaches us how to live a better life. Yes? So when you open up the Torah, like, what were the other things in the back of that? Okay, so, actually in the ark, there's no reason that we need, we have about 13 Torahs, okay? And you might say, well, some of them are big, some are small. Do they have different things in them? They're all the five books of Moses. Help me. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Everybody knows that one. And Deuteronomy, right. They're all the same. Some are written a little bit larger. There are some rules and regulations, but there's some leeway there too. It's like a book, large print, smaller print. Heavier for people that can still carry and people that have difficulties, lighter ones, okay? But they all have the exact same words. Why do we have so many? Well, probably you actually need at least two or three practically because if you have a Sabbath that falls on a holiday, that falls on a new moon, instead of just one portion, you have three separate portions to read. What you need to understand about the Torah that makes it so hard, and Debbie did a beautiful job of reading, you really have to be a study in reading the Torah. The Torah has, it's written in original Hebrew. Original Hebrew had no vowels, no punctuation, no real paragraphs. And so you really have to study, and you can't make a mistake when you're reading it. And the chanting actually, that came later, became a form of punctuation. If it kind of went down a little bit or dipped, that was like a comma. If it seemed to have a little stop to it, that was a period. If something had a flurry of notes to it, that would mean that word in this sentence was seen by the rabbis to be very important. Later on, and that's not, those notes are not written in there. They're written in a special book with the vowels that you study and then you bring them over to the Torah where none of those things exist, and you have to remember them as you read them. So, why do we have so many other than the practical reasons? Another practical reason would be a Torah has to be kosher. And you say, I thought kosher has to do with what you eat, and we obviously don't eat Torah. Not literally. Maybe, maybe figuratively you're supposed to ingest it, okay, and become Torah, whatever it is, but we don't eat it. When the letters after years of reading and, and touching them with the God, they may start to peel. They might, may start to fade. When that happens, it becomes unkosher. They have to be clear. They can't be chipped. They have to be stark black. They can't be turning brown or fading. And so, when that happens, you're not allowed to read from one. You need another, you need another script to read from. And you give that to a scribe who is uh, practiced in the art of writing Torahs, and they rewrite the letters or take out sections and rewrite the entire section. And once it's good, you bring it back in. The other reason is that this was a very large Jewish community. I wasn't here, I've been here 13 years, but as I heard, in the 60s and 70s, before people decided, you know, why do people decide to move south as opposed to north? or north as opposed to south. I guess you could do a little master's thesis on that. I have a lot of But one time, the city was getting a little bit rough and uh, wasn't always all that safe, so people started leaving it. And some Jews said, let's go north. And actually, a lot of them said, I don't know, let's go south. And they came here. At some point, north became the place to be. The city it's fixed up and it's cooler now and people want to go back and live there. So many of them decided to leave here and go there. So what's happening, unfortunately, is our community is dwindling. And so what you see is the remnants of the many, many synagogues that were here to serve literally over a thousand families. 
to now just a few hundred families, and they either merged with us or said, we want someone to protect our most precious gift, which is our Torah, so they were given over to us. We also have a Torah in there that's very special, and in fact, the daughter, you see three pictures, one is mine, and then the rabbi that came before me, and then the rabbi that came before him. The first one on the left in black and white is Rabbi Rosenthal. He went through the Holocaust. His daughter um, spoke at um, National Council of Jewish Women the other day. I was there as well, and men can be there too. She was actually in the Obama administration, and he created a position of, believe it or not, an ambassador, but not the kind with an embassy, the kind that fights anti-Semitism. And she said, you might be surprised after the Holocaust that anti-Semitism is again on the rise. Holocaust denial is on the rise. The old anti-Semitism of calling Jews on a well poisoners or Christ killers or uh, killing Jew uh, uh, Christian babies for their moths, all that kind of nonsense. People in the 21st century are believing that. But then there's also the new anti-Semitism, where supposed scientific studies, which are very unscientific, show that the Holocaust didn't happen. So you have Holocaust deniers all around the world. Um, look, criticism, whatever it is, of, of the, our beloved United States, of any country, of Israel, Look, no country is perfect, no person is perfect, and cri criticism is certainly legitimate. However, on Israel, I believe she said something, and don't quote me exactly, but it's pretty close. Condemnations of Syria, that's now killed what? 100,000 people, something like that, we don't even know how many, in the last year or two, were something like four criticisms. Iran with Ahmadinejad that's trying to get a nuclear bomb that threatens the region two, three, four, five times. North Korea, who we're really afraid of now. Same thing. Israel, Israel, 487 times. Everything else was below six. The worst terror nations in the world and 487 times. When you, ha when you say, gee, okay, Maybe it's not so cool anymore to use the old anti-Semitism and call Jews all those names that we used to call them. Let's find a legitimate one. Let's hide behind Israel and, and we'll criticize it. But honestly, it is a way of, of finding a new anti-Semitism that seems to be politically correct or acceptable. And again, once again, let me emphasize, I will criticize the United States, if I think it's doing something wrong, I will criticize Israel, I will criticize any country on earth. But when my criticism is only overblown, and it is focused particularly on one nation who some, that, that doesn't even measure up to the atrocities that many of the nations here on earth are doing, and we hear almost nothing about them, then it's crossed the line from legitimate criticism so, this daughter, her father, who's up there, went through the Holocaust. And when she told the story, when he came to the United States and eventually settled here and found a pulpit, many of those Torahs, what the Nazis wanted to do, is they said, let's kill this entire people off because of whatever, they're vermin, whatever they wanted to call us. And just as they have a museum for the dinosaurs now that don't exist, let's make this a dinosaur people. And take all these crazy things that they wear and the hats they have and these things they read from, and we'll put them in a museum. And we'll say, you know, thank, not God, but devil, Hitler, whatever. You know, they're all gone, and here's the things they had. Fortunately, Hitler is gone, the Nazis are gone, but by preserving those artifacts in a perverse way, they were preserved. Not people, but artifacts, anyway. And instead of just leaving them in a museum, or in a case, as he would have wanted, we bring them into living synagogues. And they are either repaired or they're symbolic, and they help us to remember 
Um, the, again, what we remember today, and in, in, in again, in, in, a, in you know, a disproportional way, um, the evil that, that kind of inheres in human beings, but also the goodness that's possible. So we have a Holocaust Torah. We have a Torah from the six, from 16th century, century Italy, which was in, we have a, a full museum from the second century up through the Holocaust of artifacts. The Torah was in that museum. I said, we've got to get it out of there. We have to bring it in. It's right in the center, and it's got a hard case. There are many types of Jews, but one is called Ashkenazi. That's kind of the ones you're seeing right here, okay? And we have the Torahs with the covers and the crowns and everything else. The Sephardic Jews had some different customs because they didn't have those, uh, they didn't have rapid communications and things that we had, and they grew up in a different place. So what they did, especially with the climate and so on, is they put a hard shell on the Torah, which I actually like because if you wanted to see it, all I have to do is open it this way instead of taking everything out and undressing, opening up, closing it, and dressing it back up again. So actually, in a sense, the history of this community, part of the Holocaust, part of the history of our people, I are in that arc. So any other questions about anything? Really anything, yes. Um, so, what, is it, what exactly does Shabbat mean? Sabbath. Sabbath. See, but the, the reason we use Shabbat is that um, all of us, through our different faiths, interpret it in a different way. If I said to you, okay, let's do this. Anyone. It doesn't, I'm not going to pick anyone. Anyone. If I say, it's Sabbath, what day do you think of? Sunday. Sunday, thank you. Okay. It's Sabbath. Why is that day different from all other days? What do you do differently, maybe, or special? Church. Church. Anything else? I actually remember when I was a kid that they weren't allowed to sell wine in the stores. And the meat was actually covered up because you weren't allowed to eat meat on that day. And I don't know all the reasons you can tell them one day, but whatever. So, so there were certain laws that actually in the country they had to follow. Separation of church and state was not completely there yet. Um, if you say Shabbat to me as opposed to Sabbath, and that's the original word in Genesis, the word means to rest. It is the opposite of malacha, of working. So in Christianity, the first day of the week you say, I'm going to rest. And then the rest of the days, of the, now that I'm rested, I can work. Judaism says you don't deserve rest until you work first, and then on the sixth and seventh day, after you've earned it, and you need it as human beings, you're not machines, you will get to rest. Now rest means more than just sleeping all day. It really means a rest from our day-to-day -day activities where, where we think we're mini-gods. We are creators. We are manipulating people in the world, and I'm not saying in a bad way. According to our own lights, according to what we think is good for ourselves, for our families, humanity, some people do it in a nice way, some people are not so nice, whatever it is. We said, you know what? On this day, we refrain from weekday activities. We stop working physically at our work. We do not go to school. And I'm not saying every Jew does this. We don't go to sports. We get back to seeing God as the creator and us as the creatures. And all there is is to kind of stand in awe and look at God and look at creation and give thanks. To be with your family and have special meals and sing songs over the table and give blessings over the candles and over the wine and over the food and over the children, which again, we're always going in different directions. Everybody's always got some device, no devices, no going out and spending money. It is a day devoted totally to God, to family, and to speaking about something we don't. Every time it's the same. We come home from school. How was school? Great, I got an A. Terrible, that rotten teacher, I'd never take it again. How was work? Terrific, I got so much done, it was great, all the people were wonderful. It was the worst day I ever had, my computer blew up and people were miserable and whatever. But that's all we talk about all the time, or just nothing. 
Do we ever really have a serious conversation at the table? What are we doing here? Do we have any purpose? Are we just, as Kansas once sang, dust in the wind? <laughs> or are we more than that? Okay? And, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in everything, aside from forgetting to be grateful, we forget to show joy. So here's a time to show pure joy that we're alive, that we're with our families, that we've been blessed with food to eat, and maybe enough to give to others and help them so that their lives can be better. And to recognize who made it all possible, God. So, words are crucial. We, I would say this, we share similar words in the English language. You can say peace, I can say peace. All right, and it's not so much different. You can say Sabbath and I can say Shabbat. The fact is, if I want to know it in its fullest Jewish sense, where, where secularism and other religions haven't reinterpreted it, for me, I don't care how you interpret it for yourself, then I want to read it in the original. What did this word mean? How did the rabbis interpret it? And how did they want us to live by it? Okay. By the way, the word shalom, which you hear all the time, it's one of those words, if, if you know a language, uh, I don't know, Spanish, um, French or something, whatever your Chinese, whatever you're taking these days, there are al there's always a word or many words that just can't be translated into English because there's no word in English for it because instead of having just one meaning, it has multiple meanings. Shalom means shalom, peace. But it also means hello. And it also means goodbye, which makes sense. When I meet you, I'm, I'm kind of saying peace as we meet, peace as we lead, right? Shalom. It also means wholeness, being complete. It also means fulfillment. We don't have a word like that in English. And so where there is no word in English, you saw the word maybe mitzvah in our many times, or mitzvot, in our uh, prayer books. The reason that word is not translated and I'll tell you why. Watch this. How many commandments are there? Ten. Thank you. No, there aren't. Maybe for, for us, there are now. And everybody would say, oh, the Ten Commandments, yeah, yeah, Moses, Mount Sinai, all the rest of that. If you count up every single time in our Bible that God commands Moses, the children of Israel, whoever, beyond those Ten Commandments, okay? And the rabbis believe that there was an oral Torah as well. They should know this. God believes that there was an oral, that, that along with the written word came an oral means of interpreting that word. In the interpretations came many, many, many more commandments. So since you should know this, when you say meets votes, instead of commandments, the number I would come up with instead of 10 is? 613. Oh, I'm impressed. 613. <laughs> very good. Okay, that's very impressive. All right? And, and, <laughs> they all get A's. We just made you look good. Oh, yeah. All right. So, any, anything else, guys, that, that anybody wanted to ask? I know it's getting kind of late for you and all that. You don't have to ask me more than you can. We good? Any, anybody else? Anybody else? Anything you didn't get? Let me ask you something. I'm going to ask you something. Because I had a group. I actually find this group. I shouldn't say this on tape. All right, off the record. I find this group more educated than some of the college students that come here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> some of those students will say to me, they'll say, um, you keep talking about God and I've never heard the word Jesus. I don't quite understand. Is Jesus your God? And if we, I say, no, it's your God. We have a different name. I believe we believe in the same God. We just have different names or different paths to the one God. But that's not the name we use, and the New Testament is not the book we use. They, they, the name and God are so synonymous to some people, they, say, they think that you're an idolater or something. They, they can't believe you actually have a God. 
And then they said, but you celebrate Christmas and you, the New Testament after, after we go through all of that. And I said, no, we don't. We have our own holidays. We have our own festivals. We're, we're Jewish. I mean, that's why we're different. Otherwise, we'd just be another sect of Christianity or whatever it is. Um, so, so, you know, that needs, I suppose, is there, is there anyone here, and I'm not really trying to um, compare you to college kids or those questions, but is there anybody here that, if I say that we don't believe in Jesus as God and Lord and Savior, we believe he lived, we believe that um, um, he and his followers um, started a very uh, important religion and had tremendous teachings, uh, we do believe he was Jewish and actually died that way, as a Jew. Uh, and and that, that's our belief in him. He was not God, he is not Savior, he is not Messiah, but he did teach some important lessons. So if I say we believe in God, but we can't believe in Jesus as God, or Son of God, or Messiah, can you understand that concept that we believe in God, or do you say, how could you? I'm asking you. If you say you can't, I, I get it. All right. Okay. So you're smart. You're smarter than a fifth grade. <laughs> um, and anybody else? You guys are, or you guys, uh, Reformed Jews, uh, conservative Jews are much more progressive on social issues than yes, that's than right. our church. We um, we believe in a sense that there is a. Uh, as opposed to the revelation on Sinai just ending, and that was it, and all we have to do for the rest of our lives is kind of interpret it. And we do have to interpret it. We find different meanings in every age, but there's kind of always a voice going through forward from Sinai. There is a constant revelation. There's just a lot of noise that, that, that gets in the way that, that stops us from hearing it. And we have to kind of clear our minds and get rid of the static and have a digital clarity about us so that we can hear that voice in each and every generation. All right, anything Anything else? Yes. These are called yarmulkes, you got to heads, right? Two words. Yarmulke is a Yiddish word, and that was the language that before the Holocaust, all the Ashkenazi Jews spoke. The Holocaust not only destroyed a people, it destroyed a language, it destroyed a culture. Yiddish was almost dead. It's, it's on the revival again, but it'll never probably become the official language of our people. We tried to replace it with Hebrew. It's certainly the language of Israel. Uh, most Jews should be able to pray in it, read it, have their bar about mitzvahs. Uh, not every Jew can understand it as a second language. That would be a hope that that would happen one day. So your question was, and I'll probably just wondering, like sometimes I see Jewish people like, like All right. you're wearing So in, in Yiddish, this was called a yarmulke. In, uh, in Hebrew, it's called a kippah. What it is is this. You have an arm man, right? Yeah. The yellow. What's it say? Both yellow. What do they say? Uh, live strong and it's going to be very Catholic fencing. Okay, so what, what does that teach you? And why do you have it? Do you need that? No. Well, what's it do for you? Maybe. Reminds me of my entertainment, all the uh, Thomas Bell Thank you. So it reminds you of something. The truth is, is that all of us are so busy, whether it's with school, extracurricular activities, or whatever it is. If we also look at the spiritual part of us, our souls, our attachment to God. We have responsibilities in that area too. And how do you remember them all? Well, in the secular world, we know what we do. People used to tie strings around their fingers. Some still write things on their hands and all the rest. But now with the you know, smartphones and computers and pop lights and stuff, you can write yourself notes or set alarms or maybe the old way, hey mom, dad, can you remind me to do this or that or a friend. As Jews, we have reminders too. This is a reminder every time I wear it, that God is in my presence wherever I go. It's not like I can leave this building and become something else or do something wicked or whatever it is. I know God that is there too. And if no human being is watching, God is there and God cares about me. When you enter or exit a Jewish home, 
The central prayer is from Deuteronomy that we read. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. Now, how do I remember to do that? In all the specific ways, through loving human beings and all the things we talked about. On the door, and I'm glad you opened it. You probably can't see it. This is a large one. And as you, as you leave, if you left that way, there is a, um, there's a metal object. Um, it can be anything. It can be ceramic. It can be something that you made. It can be tin foil. I don't care what's holding. What's inside is important. There's a parchment that's written from a scribe just as the Torah is written. And it has those words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God. It is a reminder every time you enter your house that there should be peace in the home. Every time you leave the house that there, you should help to make peace in the streets and amongst your neighbors. And that you have obligations to God. And that this is a Jewish home where Jewish values are lived inside and outside of it. You also saw where I put, and some of your priests have it, and maybe you can tell me the reason why, because I don't know exactly. They have those um, shawl type things. You notice I wore one. It's called a talit. And that, again, that's why I would use the word talit and not shawl or whatever you call it. You'll tell me what you call it in a moment. Okay? Because it has various fringes and knots. If you add up the value of all those fringes and knots, they come to 613, okay? And 613 is the number of commandments. So every time I put it on, I say a blessing, and it's a reminder that I serve God by doing something, not just in my head, or I have faith, or I believe. What do I do with that belief that makes a difference in this world, that I can partner with God, and together, it'll make a difference that I even live, right? So all these are, are specifically Jewish symbols that unite us together, that are very much like those armbands that remind you periodically that this is something I re want to remember, this is something I'm dedicated to, this is something I want to devote at least part of my life to. Why don't we thank uh, Rabbi Kaplan. Um, <clears throat> Does anyone know why priests wear, obviously they don't have all of these, but they have one with a cross, whatever. It, why do they wear one? Anybody know? I don't. Uh, there's, they have certain colors to represent the time of year that it is. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's green, it's ordinary time. It's like a time of rest. If it's purple, it's, uh, I think, Advent or Lent. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And, oh, uh, I learned something, because I've noticed the different colors. With these, for us, the colors, they don't mean anything. You can get any color you want. The fringes are the most important thing. When it's on, this can be any color you want. So you'll see real colorful ones. You'll see hippie ones, tie-dyed ones. You'll see some very straight ones that are just black and white and everything else. And they don't have any meaning other than that. So when I saw the colors, I thought it was really just kind of like a style. You like this style, they like this style. You like this color, they like that. No, I, I appreciate you uh, teaching me as well. Well, you closed the joint, folks. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Rabbi. Well, thank you um, for everything and so much. The many times you come and your curiosity and helping students to learn beyond their own world to the world around them.